Don't hide from me. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be in God's house today. Amen. Safe to Serve International joining us online. Happy Sabbath to you. Before we get into the message, just a few announcements here. Please mark your calendars on April 28th. That's a Sabbath night into that Sunday, April 28th. We'll be having an all-night prayer meeting and a day of fasting and prayer. Do I hear amen? amen. All-night prayer meeting, a day of fasting and prayer. And that's on April 28th. We'll be having five segments. We begin at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. And of course, you will be able to join in at your house. Joining us right here on this platform, on our YouTube channel. Five segments. Each segment is one hour. As Jesus said, could you not watch with me how long? One hour, we begin at 12 a.m. Eastern, one hour, then we return at 3 a.m. Eastern, spend one hour, we return at 6 a.m. Eastern, spend one hour together in the Lord's presence, we return at 9 a.m. Eastern, do likewise, and then our last session, segment, and service is going to be at 12 p.m. Eastern. And your last meal, your last meal on Sabbath is when we actually begin the fasting and prayer, the last meal, and then we close the fasting on that Sunday afternoon after our final session or last service. Do I hear amen? amen. Who plans to be present Amen, friends. The closer we get to the last days, the more we must spend time in all-night prayer meetings, fasting, and prayer. This was the experience of Christ before he was captured, before he was tried, before he was crucified. It was the experience of Jacob before he encountered Esau in person, and that was a time of trouble. It needs to be our experience in these last days. Secondly, after our service uh, today, we'll be having our fellowship lunch. And after fellowship lunch, we'll be having our neighborhood community evangelism. And after evangelism, we will return for our Bible class, our prophetic insights, looking at also studying to show ourselves approved of God, the Q&A session. Without further ado, let us kneel and spend a few moments in prayer as we prepare to receive a word from the Lord. Are you ready to receive God's word today? Amen. Are you ready? Father in heaven, Take full control of this service, this segment. We pray for the holy angels to surround this place. We pray for the Holy Spirit to take control of every heart, every mind. We're thankful for Jesus Christ's intercession for us in the most holy place. Pour out the spirit of truth, the spirit of warning, the spirit of instruction, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, the spirit of repentance, grant us revival and reformation. Pour out the former and the latter rain upon us today. Bless us, feed us with fresh bread from heaven's bakery is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I want to check the pulse of the church 
this afternoon on the Lord's Sabbath. Are you ready for this, my friends? I hope you're ready for this. This is uh, present truth as God uh, lives. I am gung-ho in using current events in order to present present truth in these last days, creating a conversation by using what is on the minds of the people presently, for this was the method of Jesus Christ. Are you familiar with this term? And I'm going to check the pulse of the church this afternoon here. Are you familiar with the term, the trial of the century? If so, raise your hand. Have you heard that term before? The trial of the century. Anybody? All right, hands down. When you hear the term, the trial of the century, what trial comes to your mind? Don't be afraid to say it. Thank you so much. You, you're, you're whispering down there. The trial of O.J. Simpson. They dubbed it the trial of the century. Now, we know what happened based on the media reports, what happened to O.J. Simpson this week. He died. And this has uh, recreated a conversation and people are on both sides of the spectrum. Now, that's not my point today. I want to ask you a question. I'm going to poke you today. If I were to present a message regarding the trial of O.J. Simpson, right now, right here, would you sit and listen to it? Or would you get up and walk out? Those of you online, would you turn your television off? Would you swipe away from this video and go to something else? Would you turn off your laptop, your iPad. Well, friends, today, I'm not going to waste your time on that, but I'm simply going to use the trial of the century to speak about the greater, even the greatest trial of the century. You see, friends, this is how we do things here. Current events to bring out present truth. The trial of the century, O.J. Simpson trial, did not affect us directly. It did not. But this trial of the century I'm going to address today is affecting every one of us. It's a life and death matter. So where in the Bible do we find this trial of the century? Are you ready for this, my friend? Now, if, if you don't want to hear present truth, you can get up and walk out. Amen. But if you want present truth, just stay tuned prayerfully. Go with me in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 14. Where are we going to, my friends? Look carefully at verse number 6 into verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 14. The Bible in verse number 6, it speaks of the everlasting gospel. What gospel, my friends? I want to make sure you're with me today. What gospel, my friends? The everlasting gospel. And before I get to verse 7... Verse number 6 shows us the everlasting gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 3 and verse 14, When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. And that everlasting gospel is the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. Now, you all said uh, you're ready for fresh bread from heaven's bakery. Are you ready for it, friends? Look at verse number 7. The trial of the century. Unless anybody misses this, look at verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. One question for you, and I'll pose a few more. Do you see the word judgment in verse number seven, yes or no? That's a trial, judgment, the court of law, that's a trial, that's a courtroom. 
If that's clear, my friend, let me hear amen. Now go back to verse 7. The hour of his judgment is come. Now, who is being judged in verse 7? You see, friends, historically and biblically and prophetically, we know it's God's professed people who are being judged based on Revelation 14 and verse 7. Let me quiz you. And what date began this investigative judgment? Somebody on my left hand speak to me. What date did this begin? Come on, loud and clear. Let me hear you. What date? Wonderful. October 22nd, 1844. But friends, that is the ancient landmark truth. I'm not going to remove that. God will strike me dead if I do that. That's truth. May I give you a secondary application of Revelation 14, 7? If you're ready for it, just say amen. amen. Look at verse 7 again. I want you to watch the noun and the pronoun. Now, I thought this was a sermon, a teaching lesson, but the pastor is bringing us back to English grammar class. Look at verse 7 again. This is a judgment, and Christ is being judged. Who is being judged? Jesus, look at verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God. Fear whom? So God is the noun. Fear God and give glory to him. That's a noun. That's a pronoun. Him is a pronoun. So fear God and give glory to God. For the hour of God's, the hour of his, the hour of God's judgment is come. It's Christ who is being judged in Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 7. Don't look at me strange. You all said you wanted present truth. You all said you wanted fresh bread from heaven's bakery. Do you not say that, my friends? All right. So people are wondering, that sounds strange. How is it that Christ, how is it God is being judged? That sounds strange. Strange that Jesus is being judged. It's not strange. It's only strange for those who aren't familiar with the Bible. In the New Testament, just before Christ was crucified, I have one question for you. Was Christ brought into a judgment hall? Was Christ judged by Pilate? Was Christ judged by Caiaphas and Annas, the chief priest of the Jewish nation? Was he? Go to John chapter 18 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? John chapter 18. So don't look at me strange now. It's Bible. And many times we attend churches uh, and the Bibles aren't opened. People want lullaby sermons. Where lullaby sermons put you to sleep. And when you are awakened, it's going to be too late. It's not rock on my baby here, friends. Or Mary has some little lamb. All right. Look at verse number 28 with me of John 18. The Bible says, watch carefully, my friends. Are we there? John chapter 18, look at verse 28. Then led, th then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. Underscore that. And it was early. And they themselves went out into what hall? The judgment hall. Look at verse number 29. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation, underscore accusation, what accusation bring ye against this man? If that's clear, my friend, say amen. Was Christ brought into a courthouse, a judgment hall, in, a, in an earthly courthouse? Is there an accuser? Is there an accusation brought against the defendant? Christ is that defendant. So who were the accusers? Who were the prosecutors of Christ? It was the chief priest of the Jewish nation. Do you want to see that? Go to Luke 23 with me. Luke, what chapter are we going to now? Luke chapter 23. And look carefully, my friends, at verse number 13. You know, I'm not sure. Some of you are here for the first time. When you come to save to serve, there's a way how we do things. You see, friends, 
Too much sermonizing is not good. We need to be taught. So when you leave the church service, you have some bread fragments, fragments of bread to go share with other people. So get a writing instrument and take some notes on the bulletin you received. Look at verse 13 of Luke 23. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, underscore chief priests, accusers, and the rulers, there it is, and the people, verse 14, said unto them, you have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I having what everybody, what's that word? Examined, that's it, he was judged. Having examined him before you, I have found, I have found, one more time, I have found no fault in this man. In the earth of courts, have you ever heard of a bench trial? You said yes way back there. What's a bench trial mean? Judge only trial. No jurors. No jurors. No jury. Bench only. Judge only. So Pilate right here represents a bench trial, a judge only trial. And what was the verdict from Pilate? Come on, don't act as if you, you can't speak. Talk to me. I come on, no, the words here. I found no fault in him. Look at this now. Then the next verse, you see a jury. Some jurors stepped in. Look at verse 16. Uh, well, we just read verse 15, verse 14. Come on down to verse 15. No, nor yet Herod, when Herod tried him, examined him. For I sent you to Herod. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Verse 16, listen to what Pilate said. I will therefore chastise him. What? You just said, I found no fault in him. And yet you want to chastise him? You want to batter him? You want to bruise him? You want to persecute him? You want to whip him? You want to wound him. What scene is this, my friend? Skip on down to verse number 17. I want everybody to watch verse 16. Skip on down to verse, verse 21. Verse 21, but they cried, saying to Pilate, what are the next four words from the Jewers? Crucify him. Crucify him. Go to verse 23. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. What trial was this? Now, a juror, jury trial. And verse number 24. And Pilate, the Bible says, gave sentence that it should be as the jurors, as they required. Do you want some more present truth? Say amen. You see, my friends, at the first advent of Jesus, this is a time of judgment. That scene just before he was crucified, it typifies the greater judgment. Christ is on the stand. The greater judgment going on in heaven right now. And that is what Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 7 is talking about fear God. Give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. We're in heaven. So brothers and sisters, since every earthly court has a, an accuser, has a, a prosecutor, the DA, district attorney, the great question is, who is the accuser of Christ? Come on now. Listen to me. Don't whisper to me. Louder. It's Satan. Let's confirm that. Revelation chapter 12, uh, you all said you want fresh bread from heaven's bakery, all right? So listen, eat this piece I'm giving you. Revelation chapter 12. Look with me at verse 9. The Bible says, uh, the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. 
His angels were cast out with him. And verse number 10 shows us Satan as the prosecutor. Satan the accuser. Verse 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. Why, everybody? What is the next phrase? For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. The prosecutor, the accuser, is Satan himself. So who comprise this court? Who comprise the court? Who are in this court? Well, my friends, the judge is God the Father. And who make up the jurors on the jury as Christ is on the stand? Who have come into this courthouse? Number one, the unfallen angels. Who did I say? Number two, the unfallen worlds. Who did I say? Number three, it's talking about you and me are brought into this court scene. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Desire of Ages, page 758 says, To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry of Jesus on Calvary's cross, it is finished, had a deep significance. Listen to this, my friends. It says, it was for them as well as for us. It is finished. I want everyone to watch this now. Blue words. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to whom the unfallen worlds. Not until when? The cross. The unfallen angels, the unfallen worlds had to trust God's providence and still lovingly obey him. Even though they didn't fully understand God dis uh, discarding, kicking out Satan from heaven. And not until approximately, my friends, 4,000 years afterwards, they understood when Christ was on that cross and said, it is finished. Now they realize how devious, how tyrannical, how diabolical Satan was. Go to Hebrews with me. Hebrews chapter 1. So who are in this courthouse? The unfallen angels. The unfallen worlds. While you're going to Hebrews chapter 1, notice this scripture. You all know it. When I quote it, you will confirm. Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens. Heavens is plural. Heavens is plural. And you that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. The dragon is come down. The devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Hebrews chapter 1. Where are we going to my friends? Look at verse number 2 with me. Of Hebrews chapter 1. It says, how many worlds do you think God created? Some people believe that God only made one world. And that's the earth. No. Look at verse 2. Bible says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Let's read now. By whom also he made what? The worlds. Plural. All in the courthouse. There's something in the earth court called uh, counts. When I say he is guilty on all counts, what, do, what does counts mean? When I say here are, the counts in the case. What does count mean? Accusations. Accusations. Charges. So Satan now, as the prosecutor, the accuser, what is count one? Because Christ is on the stand. Count one, Satan is saying, to all those who are in the court, even to us, that God's law cannot be kept. 
and every accuser, every prosecutor who is worth his salt, worth his hire, will say, Jewers, here are the evidences. God's law cannot be kept. So what evidence was Satan put forth? Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Satan is going to say, I am a living witness. God's law cannot be kept. Because I, Satan, I, the accuser, was created perfect. And I, Satan, sinned. So God's law cannot be kept. Where are we going to, my friends? No, wait a minute. Have your energy waned already? Huh? Are you already in REM sleep already? Are you dreaming already? Come on, wake up, friends. Amen. Where are we going to? Look at verse 14. Satan, the anointed cherub that covereth, and verse number 15 says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until what? Everybody talk to me. Until what? Until iniquity was found in thee. God's law cannot be kept. What do you think? Christ on the stand is going to respond and say, Christ is going to respond with these words. Jewers of this jury, allow me to present my case. Yes, Satan was made perfect. Yes, Satan chose to sin and remain unrepented. Yes, Satan has a case. However, Satan was only able to remove one third of the angels in heaven. Jewers, two-thirds of the heavenly angelic host remained with me in heaven. So Satan has no case. Since two-thirds remain faithful and lovingly obeying my law, the one-third could also have remained faithful. So the problem is not with God's law, my law. The problem is with Satan's heart. We don't play games here. Is that point clear? So now watch, put this point down. So that means the unfallen Angels are able to vindicate Christ's character, to vindicate that God's law can be kept. Mm. Yes. And now Christ is going to say, my father, distinguished judge, jurors of this jury, allow me to present a witness to confirm my law can be kept. Yes, uh, one earth has sinned. Yes, uh, this earth has sinned. But I made other worlds. And other worlds were tempted just as earth was tempted. But they chose not to sin. If the other worlds did not choose to sin, then all the worlds can remain faithful God's law is perfect. Look at this right here. What, my friends, I want everybody to watch this. The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. They bore the express image of Jesus. I asked one of them why they were so much more lovely than those on the earth. They replied to me by saying, quote, blue words, we have lived in strict obedience to the commandments of God and have not fallen by disobedience like those on the earth. Then I saw two trees. Two what? What comes to your mind with the two trees? The two trees in the Garden of Eden. The two trees. Listen now. It says uh, the city... The fruit of both looked beautiful, but of one they could not eat. They had power, the choice, yes, 
to eat of both, but were forbidden to eat of one. Then my attending angel said to me, None in this place have tasted of the forbidden tree, but if they should eat, they would all fall. So brothers and sisters, that means Satan went to the other worlds. Did they choose the forbidden fruit? Did they choose to sin? No. Did they choose to lovingly obey God's command? To lovingly obey God's instruction? To lovingly obey God's law? That means the unfallen worlds were brought into the court by Christ to vindicate God's character, vindicate Christ's character, to vindicate the law can be kept. Imagine that courthouse. So now, what will the Jewers return as the verdict? Count one. On count one, we find no fault in him. Do you have your pillows down there? <laughs> you're processing? Are you a computer now? Well, you need a faster RAM to move faster. We find no fault in him. You think the devil is going to back up? He's going to bring count number two. And what? Is Satan's second accusation to Christ in this judgment scene. Satan is going to accuse Christ by saying, yes, all right. The angels were faithful. One third fell with me. That's all right. But man cannot keep God's law because Christ made Adam and Eve perfect. But Adam and Eve chose to sin, which means men, humans, cannot obey God's law. Jewers, here is the evidence. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? We all know it. Verse 1 through verse number 11. Men cannot keep the law. That is the accusation. Christ is on the stand. And when Satan says, Adam and Eve sinned, man cannot keep the law, that means something is wrong with the lawgiver. Look at this statement here, my friends. It says, Satan declared, it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. If they could not keep the law, let's read the blue birds. If they could not keep the law, then what, friends? There was a fault with the lawgiver. That's it, friends. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations against God. If you attend a church, the pastor, the elders, the deacons, yes, the so-called bishop tell you, you can never overcome sin. You can never keep God's Ten Commandments. You're in the wrong church. That pastor, that so-called bishop, that so-called elder is being inspired by the devil. The same accuser of Christ. So what will Christ say in his defense? Oh, Mr. Prosecutor, you say man cannot keep the law? Well, Jewers, I came as man. Mercy. And I kept my father's law. Amen. Jewers, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through verse 11, Satan came and tempted me with all that he had, and I overcame sin. I overcame temptation. John chapter 14 and verse 30. Christ on the stand will present his evidences. And Christ will say in John 14 and verse 30. The prince of this world cometh and hath found nothing in me. That responded to Satan's temptation. Romans chapter 8. Verse 3 and verse 4, Christ will say, 
for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemned sin as a man. Condemned sin in the flesh. For what purpose? So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Christ will present one more evidence by saying, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all, all, one more time, all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Mercy. Verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in what? In time of need. So my friends, what will the Jewers return and say? On count number two, we find, finish it, no fault in him. All right, friends, and that's why I want to give you this. It says, now while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become how, brothers and sisters? Perfect in Christ, not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Red words. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. And how is this to be done? How did Christ resist Satan's temptation? With three words, it is written. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And how do we get our it is written? Commit scriptures to memory. Then throw those scriptures right back upon Satan. When Satan comes with his temptation, it is written, this is the way. Our Lord met the temptations of Satan and what, friends? And resisted Satan's temptations. We find no fault in him. We find no fault in the law. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. All right. Count number three, Satan will say, all right, you overcame. You said man can overcome, but no man can keep God's law under duress. No man will obey the law in a crisis. And all those people you claimed that overcame my temptations, it's because you blessed them. Are you preaching? <laughs> Thank you for preaching. That's the pulse to make sure you're with me. Was Christ being judged? Satan is saying, no man can keep the law in a crisis. Let me be clear. Do you know you really know a Christian in a crisis? If something is terribly about to happen, do you curse? Hmm. Do you use foul language in a crisis? Secondly, we can know a Christian when he's hungry. Have you tried to speak to a hungry man? Have you tried to perplex a hungry person? You will know a Christian in a crisis? Professed Christians lie when they find themselves in a crisis. Professed Christians steal, they rob when they find themselves in a crisis. Is the accuser correct? Mercy. So what will Jesus say? Can the law be kept in a crisis? Christ will say, my father, in an earthly court, those defendants will respond to the judge by saying, my Lord. Christ will say, my father, my Lord, Jewers of the Jewry, 
I removed my blessings from Job. And Satan was permitted to tempt Job with all of his hellish power. And yet Job did not sin. Jewers of this jury, since Job was tried to the utmost, since Job lost everything, and Job remained faithful and did not sin, Job kept my law since one man did it in a crisis all other men can do it. All other women can do it. All other boys can be faithful. All other girls can be faithful. Where's the evidence? Go to Job chapter 1 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? You all said you wanted fresh bread from heaven's baker. You don't want stale bread, stale sermons. Some of these preachers go online and buy sermons. As if you're buying stuff from Amazon. Just imagine they say, I don't want the digital copy. Give me a hard copy. And the Amazon truck pulls up at their gate and say, here's your sermon. What a sight. And they're preaching from Babylonians. They're not studying for themselves. When Sunday, Monday comes around, they stay home and they watch HBO. Well, HBO, anyway. Go to Job chapter 1 with me. Job what chapter? Spend all their time on Netflix and Hulu. They have no time to study God's word. And they come and they recycle the same putrefied sermons, diluted messages. No wonder the members of the church are spiritually constipated. No wonder they're vomiting because the food is not substantive. They're drinking from Jezebel's table, eating from Jezebel's table. But God is telling us, come to my table and partake of spiritual soul. Food. Do you want the soul food? And it's not candied yams. You hungry? It's not colored greens. You hungry? All right. Job chapter 1. Look with me at verse 6 if you're there saying amen. Here is the scene because some people don't believe Christ is being judged. Well, look at the Bible. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Who were the sons of God? Who were the sons of God? Hmm? The unfallen worlds. It's a court scene. The unfallen worlds. Look at this, my friends. Hear what the statement says. What's this? Give it to me. Give it to me. Uh, it's not there. Desire of ages, where are you? You're not there. All right. Page 800. And 34 says, there is the throne, and around it the rainbow of promise. Red words, the commanders of the heavenly angelic hosts, the sons of God. That's the phrase. The sons of God, who are they? The representatives of the unfallen worlds. They are all assembled. Look at the next sentence to prove to you it's a court scene. Next sentence, the heavenly council before which Lucifer had what, friends? What's that word? Had accused God and his son. Come back to Job chapter 1, friends, the court scene. The trial of the century. Look at verse number 7 now. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? What are you doing here? Then Satan said, Listen, I control earth. Verse number 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Is that so? You must be drunk, Satan. Has thou considered my servant Job? For there's none like him in the earth. And how did Christ speak of Job? A perfect and an upright man. One that feareth what now? Revelation 14, 7. One that feareth God and eschewed 
despise evil, hates evil. And what did Satan say? Ah, uh -huh, is that so? Is that so, Lord? Doth Job fear God for nothing? Yes, Job is perfect. Yes, Job hates evil. But is Job faithful for nothing? The reason why Job is faithful is because you are blessing him. Come to verse 10. Has thou not made an edge about Job? An edge about his house? About all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed, blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land? Verse number 11. If you remove your hand... If you remove your blessing, Job will curse you to your face. So what was Satan saying? Listen, people like Job are faithful only because you are blessing them. If you remove the blessing, allow me to tempt him and tempt them. They will sin. They'll curse you to your face. What did God do? All right, you can tempt him. And Job lost everything. Verse number 12, all the way down to verse number 22. But what does the Bible say of Job in verse 20 through verse 22? That Job still worship God. How many of you, as you go through crises, you, you don't even pray? Some of you, you even stop attending church as you're going through a crisis. You know, um, you know, I won't be coming back anytime soon because I have some things working on. You see how we are deluded? How can you work on stuff by not doing what God says you must do? And the devil has you as a hamper on the wheel. Sick of call. You can't fix things outside of Christ. Verse number 20, Job worshiped God. Yes, even the day of worship. Yes, even the place of worship. Look at this now. How many of you, you, you don't even read your Bible as you're going through a crisis. When you do that, you give ammunition to the accuser. When you do that, you're saying Satan is correct. The law cannot be kept in a crisis. Does God have your attention now? So by God's grace, stop it. What did I say? By God's grace, cease and desist. Do I hear amen? amen? Come back to verse 21 now. And the Bible says, imagine, watch this, imagine. Christ now say, my father, Jewers, I now call to the stand, Job. Let Job speak for himself in the court. And what does verse 21, what would Job have said in the court? Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked will I return thither courthouse. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord God. In all this, Job sinned not with his mouth sinned not. Job sinned not. Job sinned not. Yes. Nor charged God foolishly. Did Job vindicate God's character? So what would the Jewers bring back as the verdict? On count number three, we find no fault in him. Have you drank chamomile tea this morning? You look sleep. You sound sleepy down there. Did you drink chamomile tea this morning? So why do you sound so lack of energy? Are you sleeping? Mm. We find no fault. Go to Job chapter 2. And what will Job continue to say on the stand? Listen, Satan said, if I make him sick, he will sin. How many people say God doesn't love me because he didn't answer my prayer when I was sick? As a result, I'm walking away from God. As a result, I'm going to stop praying. 
God took my loved one from me in different ways. I am not going to serve God because God did not answer my prayer. When you think and speak and act that way, you're saying the accuser, the devil, is correct. That no man can obey God's law in a crisis. Job chapter 2, Job is on the stand. And what did Job say? Satan took away my health. He smote me with sores, a boil, a plague, from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. My wife told me to curse God and die. But what did I say in that time? I said, you speak like a foolish woman. Shall I not receive good? And evil, in all this, Job chapter 2, verse 10, in all this, it says, uh, in all this, did Job not sin? Did Job not sin with his lips? So what would the Jews return as the verdict? Count number three, we find no fault in him. You're still sleeping on me. Preachers, did you put them to sleep for Sabbath school? What happened? And the accuser will come with count number four. And count number four is this. Have you ever heard this term? I've lost everything in the early round of the contest. But the final round, I'm going to push all the chips to the center. All is on the last leg now. If I can win, I win everything. The fourth count, Satan is now saying, if you allow me to repeat what I did to Job in the last days, nobody in the last days will keep your law. If you allow me to repeat the crisis I brought upon Job in the last days, they'll curse you to your face. What do you think Christ is going to say? Go ahead. Look at Job chapter 1. I want everyone to see this. What happened in verse 10? Did Job lose all of his earthly blessings? Did he? So what would the saints encounter in the last days? What is that scripture? It's Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and verse 17. You won't be able to do what? To buy or sell except you dishonor God's Sabbath, dishonor God's seven-day Sabbath, and keep Sunday when it becomes the law of the land. If you allow me to repeat what I did to Job, they'll curse you to your face. Look at Job chapter 2. Look at verse number 4. What did Satan do to Job's body? Did Satan smote Job with sickness? Does sickness lead to death? Come on, talk to me, friends. Does sickness lead to death? So what was Satan bring in the last days? Look with me. Revelation 13. Everybody. Look at verse 15. What does verse 15 say? He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. That's the last crisis. Now you can see. Why the mark of the beast crisis is coming. It is Satan's final attempt to say the law cannot be kept. In a crisis, we will lose everything. We lose our job. You saw what happened in the pandemic, right? You can't work. You can't travel except you get that stick. All right. It's going to be worse. And how many of you bowed to get a paycheck? Mm. Are you ready for what's coming, my friends? Are you ready for what's coming? It's Satan's final attack against God's people to say the law cannot be kept in a crisis. What do you think Christ is going to say on the stand? My Lord, 
jewelers of this jewelry. Revelation chapter 14. And verse number 12 says, In the time of the mark of the beast, verse 9 and verse 10, the mark of the beast, verse number 12, Christ will be able to say, Here is the patience of the saints. Here we're, here we're, here are they that keep the commandments of God. They do what? They keep the commandments of God. They do what? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. You sound awake now. You sound awake now. Yeah. And by God's grace, we'll be able to vindicate God's character. Give me that statement. Look at the red birds. Just before us is the closing struggle of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Blue words, if there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that in this time of what, everybody? This time of peril, God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to what? Come on, read the underlined words. And to what? To vindicate his character before the world. Revelation chapter 12. Imagine, friends, imagine. Christ says, my Lord, jewelers of this jewelry, jewelers, the unfallen angels, jewelers, the unfallen worlds, may I call to the witnessing stand, Andrew Enriquez. Mercy. And I'm able to vindicate God's character in the time of the mark of the beast. Imagine that time, brothers and sisters. And what will I be able to say? Satan tempted, he took away everything. But by God's grace, I remain faithful to his law because I love him. And I will quote Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. They overcame him. By the, oh, you know it, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved, your honor, Jewers, I loved not my life even unto the death. Volume 5, page 147, your honor, Jewers, volume 5, page 147, death before dishonor. Or the transgression of God's law has been my motto. What will the jewelers return for the verdict on count number four? I find, we find. You're awake now. No fault in him. Friends, please. Do you know God wants you to vindicate his character? I didn't hear all of you. Do you know God wants you to vindicate his character? Yes. You might not literally be in the court. As if you go, went to a court downtown Atlanta, wherever you're from. Downtown, I don't know, Kingston, Jamaica, New, Manhattan, New York. But your life shows you are a spectacle to the world and to angels. That's not supposition. That's not my opinion. That's not conjecturing. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 9. We are a spectacle to the world and to angels, brothers and sisters, and to men. You are called to vindicate God's character. Though I lose everything, I still obey God. Do you know what Job said? Though he slay me, yet you're sleeping on me. You're sleeping on me. Though he slay me, what did Job say? Yet will I trust him. Yet will I serve him. Yet will I love him. Yet will I obey him. Count number five. Go to Zechariah chapter three. Count number five. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. In Revelation chapter 14, 
I'm coming back to the opening scripture. And verse number seven, the Bible says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. That date was October 22nd, 1844. I want somebody on my right hand to tell all of us what work did Christ begin in heaven? October 22nd, 1844. I'm listening. Thank you. The work of investigative judgment of his people. And what will be the end result? What will Christ blot out? Somebody on my left. What will Christ blot out? Surrendered sins of his people. So what is count number five? Count number five, Satan is saying. The mere fact we have sinned, we don't deserve to be saved because I, Satan, and my angels have sinned. You have not saved us. Their sins cannot be blotted out. Are you ready for this? Do you want to see the second court scene? If you want to see it, say amen. amen. Because you had no other choice. I will still show it to you. Go to Zechariah chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? Zechariah chapter 3. Look at verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan doing what now? Is that a court scene? Talk to me. Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The accuser of the brethren, the prosecutor, you can't save him. You can't save her. What is the setting? Look at verse number 10. Verse 9 rather, verse number 9. It's a time when God says, I will remove iniquity from the land and from the people in one day. Somebody on my right hand, what is that one day when God says, I, I blot out sin? What is that one day called? Come on, talk to me. The day of atonement. Look what Satan is saying, understand? Look at this, my friends. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins he has tempted God's people to commit. And he urges his accusations against them, declaring that by their sins, they have forfeited divine protection and claiming that he has the right to destroy them. Stop right there. Does the prosecutor in the earth court is attempting to find the defendant guilty, yes or no? All right, and to put that defendant behind bars, yes or no? Or to give that guilty defendant the death penalty? What is Satan's objective? To destroy us. Count number five. The devil to destroy us. Does the prosecutor bring evidences, does he? Does he bring witnesses, does he? Does Satan have a book of sins? Does Satan know our sins? Continue. It says, uh, Satan pronounces us just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favor of God. Are these, Satan says in the court, the people who are to take my place in heaven, the place of the angels who did unite with me. They profess to obey the law of God, but have not kept his precepts. Is Satan correct in the court? Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? Has Satan not been correct? How many of us put your job above evangelism? How many of us spend more time on job and even schoolwork more than having devotion, more than spending time in your Bible, more than witnessing? We put man first than God. If man says, 
get to the job at 9 a.m., we are there at 8.45. But if God says, uh, come to church at 10 a.m., we come at 11 a.m. To man, we give no excuse to get a paycheck. But to God, we find every excuse in the book. We deserve to be lost. You said you wanted fresh bread, did you not? Oh, pastor, I'm choking. Do you want some water? <laughs> Continue. I got some living water for you. Listen, have they not placed their own interest above God's service? Yes, he's correct. Have they not loved the things of the world? Yes, the devil is correct. Look at the sins that have marked their lives. Behold, their selfishness. Are we not selfish? God has blessed us with earthly blessings, and we keep the blessings for ourselves. Somebody's hungry, and we wouldn't even give them a pittance. Selfish! It's all about me, myself, and I. Selfish! Is he correct? Some of us, God has blessed with a country property, and we don't even pray to say, Lord, who can I assist? Now, not everybody must come with their bungalow, their stuff on your property. No! Get away from here. But pray, Lord, who can I assist? But we say, no, let's build bigger barns and say, my hard work has paid off. My degrees and my, 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 my job has paid off. And we don't even help one person Selfish. Listen, look at their malice, their hatred, one for another. How many husband and wife can't get along, refuse to get along, and yet they claim to be Christians? Is that you? How many brethren can see eye to eye based on Bible and spirit of prophecy, but to have grudge and bitterness? Continue here. It says, will God banish me and my angels from his presence and yet reward those who have been guilty of the same sins? What the, that's what the devil is saying. In the courthouse, thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. So Satan Count number five, if you save them, you're unjust. If you save them, you're on fear. Because we have committed the same sins, and yet you have barred us from life eternal. Listen, so what will Satan say? Justice demands that sentence be pronounced. The prosecutor, accuser in the court is saying, jurors, Please return a guilty verdict. Satan is saying, Jewers, return the death penalty. Judge, give them, throw the whole library at them. The death penalty. What will Christ be able to say in response? Go to verse number two. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? What will Christ be able to say? Yes, Andrew has sinned, but Andrew has surrendered, and Andrew has chosen not to sin anymore. Jewers, here is the book of Andrew's sins, and here is the book of life. His name is written there. The evidence is they have sinned, but they have repented. They have sinned, yes, but now they have gotten victory over sin. They have followed John chapter 5 and verse 14. Thou hast been made whole. Go and sin no more. Yes, John chapter 8 and verse number 11. Neither do I condemn thee. Sins you have surrendered. Go and sin no more. In the courthouse crisis, come on, bring the books of records. Andrew's name is there. Hillary's name is there. Christian's name is there. 
Faith's name is there. Your name can be there. They sinned, but now they have gotten victory over sin. What will the Jewers return for the verdict? We have found no fault in him. Is that point clear, my friends? Count number six. What will Satan say as the accuser and the prosecutor? Satan will say, Jewers, this man is not fear. Because based on the Bible, not everybody is going to be saved. He only will save some while the rest will be lost. How could this be a fear man? <laughs> you sat up a while ago, my brother. Yes, he's on fear. He will only save some while others will be lost. And that's why in some churches, ministers preach, everybody will be saved. Universalism. They are following the lies of Satan. How could this man be fear? Some are going to be saved while others are going to be lost. What will Christ say in response? My Lord, may I approach the desk. Jewers, may I now speak. John chapter 3, verse number 16. All men have been called to be saved. Why? The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Then Christ is going to add to John chapter 3. And verse number 16. All men should be saved, but not all men will choose to be saved. Matthew 22 and verse 14. For many are called, but only few are chosen because only few will choose him. And then Christ will say, look at my record. What more could I have done? Go to Isaiah chapter 5. Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah chapter 5. In verse number 1, Jesus says, I planted a vineyard. Verse 1, verse number 2, I removed the stones. How many of you garden? Do, do you have a garden, friends? Do you know we all have to plant our own food? Do you know when you're gardening, you must prepare the ground and remove the stones, remove the weeds? That's what's happening in verse number 2 of Isaiah chapter 5. I did everything for the vineyard to bear good grapes. Look at verse number three. And now look at the judgment scene. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, what is the next word? Judge. Is that a judgment hall? Is that a court scene? Is Christ being judged? Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. Is Christ being judged? Do you know somebody just said, what that man is preaching is heresy? How do you mean Christ is being judged? Who can judge God? Watch right here, friends, again. Look at verse 3. And now, O oh court, now on fallen worlds, now angels, now people on the earth, now Seventh-day Adventists, now people from Babylon churches, now judge, I pray you. Between me and my vineyard, between me and my church, that's the vineyard. Look at verse 4. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? What will the jewelers say now? The verdict on count number 6, we find. No thought in him. All that needs to be done for all of us to be saved is being done. If we are lost, T. Marshall Kelly sang this song. If I'm lost, it's no 
bodies fought but mine. Hillary, help me out here. If, if I'm what now, how it goes? If I die and my soul be lost. You see, you see, she just simply put me in first gear. Once she puts me in first gear, I can finish it now. If I'm lost, if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. Judge between me and you. What more could I have done? <sighs> Judgment. What will you say? We come on, say it with me. We find no fault in him. Imagine God has blessed us with a church right here. Well, I repeat that. God has blessed you all with Safe to Serve Center for Evangelism right here in Marietta, Georgia. And yet some of you refuse to come to church. What more could Christ do that he has not yet done? Bible studies are presented, but you're too busy. What more could Christ do? You see my point? We have practical demonstrations. Survival tips, Brother Imoni. How to get ready for the last days. Country living, health reform. We have all of it. All night prayer meeting. Day of fasting and prayer. But we don't see our need. What more can Christ do? He has not yet done. Ministry for young people, we don't care. What more can Christ do? He has not yet done. Judge between me and you. It's a judgment. Christ is being judged. At the end of it, everybody will say, we find no fault. Even the devil will say it. Even the accuser, the prosecutor. I've never seen a courthouse where the prosecutor stands up and say, you are correct. I've never seen that done. But Satan will have to one day say, I find no fault in Jesus. And we are called to vindicate God's character. I want to make this point so solemn and so direct, nobody misses it. I want to see the hands of all the husbands in the church right now. Husbands, raise your hand. Oh, come on, husbands. Hands down. All the wives, raise your hand right now. Wives. Now keep your hand raised for a minute. Do you know, in the Bible, you are called to be the crown of your husband? Don't, do not put your hand down as yet. Do you know you are called to vindicate your husband's character? In other words, when somebody sees your husband, they must know he has a spiritual wife. And when somebody sees you, wives, they must say you have a spiritual husband. Hands down. Go to Proverbs chapter 12. Where am I going with this? Just as the woman, the wife, is called to be the crown for her husband, the church is called to vindicate Christ's character. Because the wife of the literal husband represents the church and Christ is the husband. Proverbs chapter 12. Where are we going to? Oh, mercy. What can I do to keep this church awake? Huh? You know what? Can somebody go in the back and get the five-gallon buckets and pour some water inside there, please? You need some rain here. You need some showers, my friends. The Holy Ghost, Proverbs chapter 12, look at verse 4. If you're there, say amen. A virtuous whom? A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness. Yes, emphasis. Is as rottenness in his bones. The church is likened unto the wife, the woman. 
The church must be the crown of her husband. But those who don't lovingly obey God's Ten Commandments, you put Christ to open shame. Go to Proverbs 31. Look at verse 10 of Proverbs chapter 31. The Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman? And the real question is, who can find, can Christ find a virtuous church? You know what? Let me poke the church some more. Husbands, if you know you have a virtuous wife, raise your hand. If your hand didn't raise, you didn't see me afterwards with your wife. <laughs> so we can have uh, marital counseling. Let me see the hands again. My two hands are up. That's it. Who can find a virtuous woman? Listen to me attentively. And Christ on the witnessing stand is saying, Can I find a virtuous church? To vindicate me, go to verse number 11. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Mercy. So that he shall have no need of worry. What a wife this is. What a church this is. Verse 12. She will do him good and not evil. All the days of her life. This is the kind of church Christ is looking for. To do him good and not evil. And what shows us good? The law. Loving, loving obedience. Why does a wife love her husband? Why would a husband cherish his wife? Because of love. And God is love. Verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. That means the mother is the crown of her children. Now children, let me pour the church some more. Children, if you know that your mother is virtuous, raise your hands. And you don't need, listen, mothers, look, look at your children. If any one of them did not raise their hand, give them no lunch later on. <laughs> None. <laughs> Tell them to fast and pray and become converted. The mother, the children know, mother is converted. Mercy. That means members' application, members who come to Safe to Serve must know the leaders of Safe to Serve are converted. Amen. This is a blessed mother, a blessed church. Her husband, verse 28, her husband also, and he praiseth her. How many times husband? Do you praise your wife? Pull the church some more. Husband, if you told your wife you loved her this week, raise your hand. Oh, watch this now. <laughs> wife, you know if he's lying. Raise the hand. Oh, mercy. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Hands down. If you told your wife she looked good recently, raise your hand. Wife, look, at, look, look beside your wife. You know what? Hands down. Watch this now. Watch this. Let me fix my tie. Listen. Husband, if you gave your wife flowers recently, flowers within the last week, you know what? The last month, raise your hand. Did you give your wife flowers within the last month? Oh, look, uh, look, look at this. One, two, three, four, five. Go ask her. 
Ask her. No, 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 no. Ask the children. Ask them. Five hands. Mercy. When Elijah comes, he sets the home in order. And if Satan can destroy the marriage, he destroys the home. He destroys the church. And nobody can vindicate Christ. Verse, 20, verse 30, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be what? Praised. Everybody look carefully now. I'm going to compare verse 31 with verse 23. Verse 31 says, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her her own works praise her in the gates verse 23 her husband is known where how is the husband why is the husband known in the gates it's because his wife is virtuous the husband is renowned the husband has influence in the community because the wife is converted. Flip it. Christ will be known to those in the world because the church members are converted. Is that point clear, my friends? Fear God. Give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. When we fear God, we vindicate his character. And to fear God means to get victory over sin. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. When we give God glory, we vindicate his character. When we worship him as creator on the seventh day Sabbath, we vindicate his character. What will be the verdict? We find no fault in him. And now the court is over. I have never seen the prosecutor show, uh, throw a temper tantrum in the court. I, I have seen defendants when they hear guilty, guilty, and he's looking at a long sentence. Have you ever seen defendants get up and rush the judge? Jump over the table to hurt the judge. But this time, Satan is going to throw a fit. Satan is going to throw a fit. Look at this statement here, my friends. Watch. Notwithstanding that Satan has been constrained to acknowledge God's justice and to do what, friends? Come on now. And to bow to the supremacy of Christ, his character remains unchanged. I'll come back to that. The spirit of rebellion, like a mighty torrent, again bursts forth. Stop it right there. The Bible says, I love this, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through verse 11, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee. Does the devil have a knee? Does the devil have a tongue? Imagine in the courthouse, the prosecutor says, defendant, you're right. <laughs> I've never seen that. But you'll see it when the devil does that. I've seen defendants throw a fit in the church, in the court. I've never seen the prosecutor. But what will Satan do? Filled with frenzy, he determines not to yield the great controversy. The time has come for a last desperate struggle against the king of heaven. He rushes into the midst of his subjects, endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. Let's burn this court down. Why? The Jewers now turned and say, Christ was understand, 
but we find no fault in him. So where's the fault? The fault is in the accuser. He deserves the verdict of guilty. He deserves to be death. And what does Satan say now? Let's burn this court down. Let's take that city. Watch this, friends. Let's take that city. But of all the countless millions whom Satan has allured into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. Will you say amen, friends? Amen. No more accusation. The accuser of our brethren is what? Is, is cast down. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan. But they see that their case is hopeless, that they cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage is kindled against Satan. Mercy. Do you want to be in that group? We're in, you realize you're doomed to destruction. And now the only thing you can do is say it was you who deceived me. But it's going to be too late. I want to poke you again. I want to agitate you again. Imagine a lost husband and a lost wife. And the wife turns and she says, it was you, it's you, who has caused me to be lost. No, you made your own choice to be lost. Or vice versa. Children saying, Mom, Dad, it was you who caused me to be lost. That might be 50%. But you, children, chose to be lost. What is your decision today? We are all in the courtroom. What is your decision today? Will you choose to be saved or will you choose to be lost? Will you choose to vindicate that God's law is love? Or will you choose to justify the devil with his accusations? Your choice is a life and death matter. Who do you choose today? All I can say is, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today, I call heaven and earth to be a witness against you. That today, April 13th, I set before you life and death. In the context of the everlasting gospel, the courtroom. And I told you to choose life. Will you choose life or will you choose death? I choose life. What do you choose? I choose to lovingly obey my Savior. Who do you choose? I choose to believe I can overcome, overcome sin because Christ overcame sin. Do you believe it? If so, raise your right hand. How many counts did you get? How many counts did Satan bring against Christ? Six counts. We find no fault in him. But there's a seventh count. Imagine when Christ comes. And Satan and sinners and the fallen angels are destroyed. Do you know what the whole redeemed people will say? God is love. Mercy. Woo. The great controversy is ended. The court is ended. The judge has spoken. The father has spoken. Sin and sinners are no more. Fire and brimstone descend, destroy Satan. Fallen angels, unrepentant sinners. What more could Christ have done? Sin. Sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. It's clean.
clean. Watch now. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats to the vast creation. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy. Four words. What are the next four words? What will we all declare? That God is love. One more time. God is love. One more time. God is love. All right. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Come on. If you love me. One more time. If you love me. How much do you love him? Did God speak to your heart today? Did you receive fresh bread today? And count number seven, we will say God is love. We find. <laughs> Do you see it now? So the unfallen angel said we found no fault in him. The unfallen worlds said we find no fault in him. The redeemed will get their chance. We will get our chance. God is love. We. Let's practice it. Repeat after me. We find no fault in him. One more time. We find no fault in him. We will say it. Count number seven. We find no fault in him. In him, God is love. Praise God, my friends. Praise God. That's it for today. That's it for today, for now. But you know, Bible class is coming up. We're about to start a new Bible study series. Learn more of the Bible. Get more fresh bread. Not stale bread. Stale sermons. Fresh bread. Present truth. To prepare you to commit, recommit your life to God in baptism. Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to come up higher in the Lord? Do you want the certainty of your salvation? I'm going to make one simple appeal. If you want to be a part of it, just raise your hand. Who wants to be a part of it? Yeah, all right. Is there, amen. Anybody online, you know how to contact us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this word today. We are thankful that you have spoken to every heart that was sincere. We want to so live and be prepared on count number seven. Seven is completion. Seven is finality. We want to say we find no fault in you. God is love and be saved at last in your kingdom. On that new earth, may we allow nothing to hinder us from being saved Daily. I die daily. I live for Christ daily. May this message stain our minds and leave an indelible mark upon our minds. We can now leave this place and go and share with others some fragment of truth that we learned today. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus, our great high priest. Thank you for sweet salvation. Bless every hand that was raised. Bless every marriage. Bless every home. Bless saved to serve. Center for evangelism. May we use these current events 
to present the everlasting gospel, the present truth, to awaken and to save people. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering. Who can find a virtuous woman? May the virtuous church say, Amen. Amen. Amen.